cheapest phone in the Gambia. AfriPhone is back in a brand new style. AfriCell, the biggest and the best GSM operator in the Gambia, is setting trends once again. Get an AfriPhone for $350 only and receive one hour of free talk time spread over three months. $350 is only you can get a dual SIM phone with a wireless FM radio, memory card slot, internet access, long-lasting battery, and one hour of free talk time. Where AfriCell goes, oh, oh, nobody. There's to follow. There's to follow. Africell is setting trends once again. I'm sure you still love WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and Viber. Your favorite GSM operator, Africell, knows this. That's why you can now enjoy more at the same price. Activate the social media bundle and be online for 24 hours for ten dollars is only. Hello. Activate the social media bundle for ten dollars is only and receive 40 megabytes. Where Africell goes, oh, oh, nobody dares to follow. Dares to follow. Has happened. Will happen. May happen. Is happening. Let us know. Send an email to info at ptv.gm or call us 611-1666. Paradise TV. Reflecting Gambia. Gambia, the smiling coast of Africa. Let's get interactive on social media. Say your views and opinions with us on Facebook at PTV Gambia, Instagram at PTV Gambia, Twitter at PTV Gambia, and YouTube at PTV Gambia. You can download our app on Google Play Store and App Store. PTV Reflecting Gambia. another young person of immense achievements and uh, we would um, go straight to the program and ask him to introduce himself. Kemu Bojang is a youth councillor uh, nominated to the uh, Carnifin Municipal Council. Uh, he has been involved in youth work for the last so many years. He's also the Youth Secretary General of the United Democratic Party. Uh, about two weeks ago, they had their National Congress uh, of the Youth Wing. And today he is here just coming, uh, as he told me, from uh, General Council meeting. Uh, Kim Bojan, welcome to the Political Economy of Development. You have been around, you have been uh, on screen, you have been on newspapers, uh, on youth work. How and when did you start youth work in the Gambia? Um, I'd just like to start by thanking Amalu for giving me the opportunity to be here, Mr. Tan. Um, as you said, uh, my name is Kemo Boja. Um, I am a young Gambian who has been active in, you know, in the activism space and in the political space for a, for a while now. My, my activism or my involvement into youth work and community work started off pretty early. Um, we were the young people of the then Lender Han Society. Um, and I was also born in the SOS Children's Village, where then my dad was a director at the Children's Village. 
So we grew up in an environment where it was more of community service that we had to do every Saturday and we had to also work with other children. So from Lender Hand Society during my primary school, you know, years two, I, I was a member of the Gambia Red Cross Society, Gambia Scout, Gambia Scout Association, and also the, the Duke of Edinburgh's Award, which is also known as the Award Scheme in the Gambia. So from then on, at the age of 14, I became pretty active in politics, especially partisan politics. Uh, back in junior school and high school, I always got in trouble for questioning a lot of things that were happening you know, during the time. Um, my teachers knew that I was the one who wouldn't ever go on the street to welcome the president when he was coming back. So at, at some point, they, they would never take me along or they would always ask me to go home when they were going on the street because I would never do it. And also, I was someone who, even though I was a senior prefect during school, I would never go to the July 22nd March. I would go to Independence, but when it was July 22nd, I wouldn't attend. So from then on, I, you know, that was what molded me into who I am. But that was also based on the influence that I had from home. Um, my family has always been opposition from NCP um, um, years, going on to the formation of UDP, um, you know, the metaphor force into the UDP too. So, as they say, your political culture and socialization has a very big in, in, impact on your line of thinking and your ideas. So I believe, you know, that was how I was brought up and the conversations around me. So it really molded my political experience. Yeah. So at the age of 14, I became active within my ward and my constituency, would go on rallies and would listen. So we were also one of the active young people who were on the ground during the 2016 elections and we were very vocal. We wrote a letter to the opposition parties around March of 2016 also asking them to form, um, form a union. This was based on, because I knew that it was one of the UDP's agendas that was going to be held during their April Congress in Basse. So with the help of other journalists, we had a group called the PYN at the time, which was a progressive youth network, where we said, okay, let's, you know, let us write a letter to the opposition. And it, you know, those were some of the things that we did then. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Very, very rich, very interesting. Um, the culture of uh, youth activism has been here for a very long time. You have uh, National Youth Week, uh, National Conference, uh, Youth Conference. You even have the National Council, uh, uh, National Youth Council. Um, this segmentation, uh, some people are now questioning uh, the, the rationale behind having youths as a constituency because uh, everything that is uh, spread around seems to be for, for youths. The first 18 years of your life, the first 21, 25 years of your life is really uh, the community investing in you. Mm -hmm. through education, through training, and uh, through uh, a process of uh, passing on the culture and the values of the society. So that when you are of age, when you are a major, uh, you can also become a positively contributing member. Yeah. Um, when I was uh, your age, 14, and going to school, high school, and, and, and all of that, uh, this is the point. We had one Ministry of Education, Youth, Sports and Culture. So it, it packs all these uh, uh, value uh, acquisition process and uh, the training of uh, a young person to become a useful and an acceptable member of society. Uh, but after the 94 coup d'etat, we have uh, a dispersal if not a proliferation of institutions uh, targeting uh, as it were the youths and uh, you have a youth and sports ministry for one uh, culture is on yeah. its own uh, with tourism um, you have um, uh, higher education you have education so uh, my question is that uh, when we were young we we, we felt the impact more than. More, more, more than now. Now it seems a little diffuse and there seems to be a competition even within the uh, national institutions yeah. for the attention of youth. 
uh, on top of that, the youth themselves are organized in different uh, philanthropic setups. Uh, also in uh, 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 the, the National Youth Council. These, these are all, uh, if you like, uh, they are not coherent. And uh, I think a lot of thinking is going that why is it that uh, in the West or the developed democracies, they really don't have a ministry for youth. Uh, they hardly ever have uh, programs, you know, Designated for designated yeah. for youths because everything else I mean, around, yeah. around around the youths yeah. and preparing them so that they can be uh, useful members of society. I, I just want to uh, get your thinking. Yes, on um, some of some of these uh, segmentations. I think it's a very valid uh, thought, and when you think of it, I think a lot of policy decisions made in our part of the world are most of the time determined by what is you know, um, mainstream at the time. For example, the example I'll use is the new formation of the Ministry of Women's Affairs. Mm -hmm. It's because there's, there's been a lot of talk around gender, feminism. So the government thought, okay, because there's a lot of talk about it, it would be better for us to have a new ministry, even though, you know, um, it was under the office of the, uh, of the vice president. Mm -hmm. I think, unfortunately, because we do not make a lot of choices for ourselves as a country, mm -hmm. It has caused a lot of these things happening um, because at, at a certain period of time, especially in the 90s, there was a lot of talk around young people and young people's empowerment mm -hmm. uh, um, globally. Mm -hmm. So probably that was the reason. Like I am taking, I am taking this decision now that the government has taken to be an uh, 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 to be a reason, mm -hmm. and because a lot of globally young people now are seen as a marginalized group, especially when it comes to us being a third world country, mm -hmm. it has led to governments thinking, okay, it's important that we have a ministry which would look into the affairs of this marginalized group, even though I do not see it that way. For example, when you talk about young people's political participation, mm -hmm. uh, the oldest the person... Mayor, the mayor of KMC, KMC yeah, yeah, is a young person. Yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, the oldest president we've had in this country is 50 years, has been 50 years old. Mm -hmm. The first president we had w w was 38 or 39. The second president we had was in his 20s. So when we talk about youths not being empowered, I think it's more of youths just not taking part in the political field. For example, you don't know these things until you are in the political field yourself. Because I used to think the same way. Mm -hmm. But when I got into it, I realized that there's a lot of opportunity for young people. Mm -hmm. But we as young people do not, because we have been used to this idea of tokenism. We have been used to this idea of if it being handed to us. Yes. We want to sit and wait that it's handed to us. And power is never handed to you. Mm -hmm. You have to get up and you have to see how best you're going to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And going back to your point where you said that, every, in fact, everything revolves around the majority when it comes to population. Mm -hmm. We make up 65% of the population of this country. So it is, just, it is just logical that when it comes to tourism, it revolves around young people. Absolutely. When it comes to governance, it revolves around us. Mm -hmm. When it comes to sports, it revolves on, around us. On, on Saturday, uh, ST yes. uh, filled the stadium yes. with young and people. people. And he himself is, is a, a young person. Young person. Right. So, so, so for me, I, I think uh, we need in Africa, at least, or at least in the Gambia, to depoliticize uh, this uh, categorization. Yeah. Because uh, you rightly mentioned this uh, women empowerment. I mean, from the 70s, late 70s to early 80s, uh, you had women in development. So for that, the, the, the women, the women uh, um, uh, women's bureau mm -hmm. and a federation of women. I mean, uh, I mean, the, the tokenism you mentioned is of concern because uh, nine months of the year, uh, or twelve months—I mean, eleven months of the year—women are working on their gardens. Mm -hmm. They are selling fruits. They are selling food. I mean, women work so much, and uh, they are not getting the recognition they that did. they deserve. Uh, you would have thought that with a ministry dedicated to them, um, their financial inclusion and financial security would be uh, something assured. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's very encouraging. Now, uh, you have a Gambia Women's uh, Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Uh, women have been uh, doing a lot. Young people, I mean, globally, 
Bill Gates was a young man when yeah. he started Microsoft. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Yeah. Now Mark Zuckerberg is yeah. still a young man. Yeah. So, so really, I, I think um, uh, if the ecosystem is right, uh, you will have our genius young people uh, caught very early, yeah. and they would find uh, their 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 mission or their destiny uh, without um, having to have this categorization. Because you have this unfortunate uh, situation where irregular migration has become a development issue, yes. and uh, the the poverty, the hopelessness, and the lack of opportunity in the Gambia has forced a lot of young people to migrate. To migrate. Uh, when we were young boys and girls in the Gambia, uh, we had a sense that uh, education was a, was a leveler, mm -hmm. but it's, it was also a way forward. Yes. Now, my, my question is this. What do you think uh, is responsible for this, if you like, evaporation of opportunities? But what is your own take of our education system, the process that we take to skill uh, young people, to prepare them uh, uh, for, for a, a purposeful life yeah. uh, in, the, in the 21st century? Um, f first of all, I'd just like to start with the educational system. I think um, um, in a lot of instances, it is where our, our, our scholars are being trained that needs to be empowered first. When you talk about the Gambia College, for example, where teachers are being trained is one of the least um, 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 invested in institutions of this country. And a lot of times now teaching has been more of a second choice um, profession for a lot of people or people that haven't been able to access university because of funding or because of other reasons are, are the people that go to the Gambia College when it shouldn't be that way. I think that being one of the reasons has caused why our educational system has done uh, has done has downgraded another reason is that because it has the teaching is no more lucrative when you look at it there's no more prestige to to the pros, uh, to the to the profession the pays are terribly bad and other reasons are the conditions up, especially up country are just you know in, inhumane for anyone that has been one of the reasons that have led to the decline in the quality of our education. I also think the institutions where these young people are being trained, the schools themselves, when you compare what is the budget of education to the budget of the office of the president, it says a lot about where the country is at the moment. That is, um, and, and these are reasons I believe and more why our, our educational system has declined. The other question also being why opportunities uh, have, have really declined in, in, you know, or evaporated. I like to link everything back to colonialism or in a way or where the root cause. I, I, I believe that there has no, not been any, any act or any idea to build a nation state since after independence as a country or as a continent. When you look at the systems that the colonialists left here, these are the same systems that the Gambian government after independence, PPP, with all the things they have done good, um, um, had to continue on. What we did as a country was we just replaced the personnel that the colonialists left here and never really built a Gambia that reflected the Gambian people. One which goes back to the educational system was that our educational system was set in a way that it was set to, to bring up people that would help in the colonial government as clerks, as nurses, but not to, um, to, to accelerate and get up to the higher positions in government. That same educational system was built in a way that it would make us job seekers instead of job providers. Our educational system hasn't made us creative enough. That anybody that goes to school is always thinking of how do I gain employment, but not how do I create employment. Because our educational system is not technical, it's not hands-on where people learn skills. Um, one, of the, um, one of the commitment points that the UDP has done is that it, it would make Skills acquisition. Kimo, I'll, I'll correct you here yes. because uh, you are too too young at the moment yes. uh, to know. But the Gambia Technical Training Institute yes. was established in the eighties. So was MDI. Um, uh, vocational education was also incorporated and to some extent even mainstream. Yeah. Uh, simply because it was necessary 
to diversify mm -hmm. uh, the learning opportunities. I know some people, I think uh, someone like uh, the great uh, Tafnia, yes. Taf Construction, yeah. uh, went to some of those um, uh, training. But I take the point that um, uh, the skilling of a nation and uh, helping uh, a nation to be creative uh, really is at the uh, foundation mm -hmm. of this challenge. Yeah. But remember also Gambia was an improbable state. Yes, I agree. Uh, I read a very uh, insightful article by uh, Musa Ba uh, talking about the priorities of the first president of the Gambia that uh, he wanted to assure the survival of Gambia as a nation state. And therefore, uh, he emphasized living within our means mm -hmm. and trying as much as possible not to be investing in wild elephant projects. But uh, that shouldn't take away from the great achievements that yeah. the education system uh, was able to uh, pass on. Uh, if you do well enough, it doesn't matter whether you are the son of a farmer or you are the son of a, a grain uh, seller in Banjul you get a chance to go and compete in the best yes. universities. And, I, I agree and, with that. And I think some of those people have eventually became a brain gain to the world, mm -hmm. especially during the days of the dictatorship. Yes. So, so I, I really think uh, we have been transitioning uh, to a better place. To, uh, very soon we will be celebrating 56 years of independence. Uh, I think um, our theory of government, what government should be about, uh, what role should young people, because young people always uh, are at the head of revolutions, mm -hmm. whether it's technological or political or social, yes. you know, uh, we talked about ST briefly. Mm -hmm. So if we can just uh, look at that also, the role of young people in this process of transformation. Yes, um, I think, um, just going back to the point that you were raising, I, and I agree, and entirely that um, schools like the GTTI and MDI have been you know, doing good. But when you look at Gimpa, for example, in Ghana, MDI was supposed to look like Gimpa. Uh, when, you look like, uh, when you look at GTTI and you look at ASCON in, um, um, in Nigeria and other places, I believe it goes back to the point I was trying to raise earlier, which is that to say that, yes, in as much as they were here, but they were short-lived when, when you compare them to most of their counterpart institutions around the... Uh, I, I agree, they did yes. not transform yes, exactly. as, as times change. Yes. But uh, remember, uh, there, there was a... There, I, mean, I think it's still there. There is this foundry yeah. at GTTI. And uh, for the last so many years, I think it has been kind of moribund. Mm -hmm. It was a gift from Turkey. Turkey, which is uh, an ancient civilization, mm -hmm. and you know they, they know the value of engineering and Definitely. fabrication. Yeah. So, so for me, I, I think um, uh, the young people uh, have a role here in uh, uh, breaking out of the mold. Uh, the young people have a role in inspiring the nation uh, to go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. But that that uh, is is almost like a genius thing. Genius in the sense that you must have the confidence to say that, okay, the way they make these uh, cooking pots mm -hmm. uh, locally, is it possible to uh, recruit science and design uh, to make them better and go to the foundry and make them in uh, uh, commercial uh, quantities, yeah. uh, one to be exported, but then to also uh, brand the country. Yes. I mean, just, just a little bit of creativity. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the music, uh, when I was young, there were so many Gambian bands uh, compared to Senegal, and they used to even go uh, yeah, to, to Senegal, Senegal okay. and play, and they, 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 they would be involved in rehearsing, they would be involved in um, all kinds of uh, 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 activities. When you have social events, you have you know, really, really uh, high-class uh, music. So, so at the end of the day, I, I just want to say, uh, again, Kemo, that under the circumstances, uh, the young people have been given a lot, and a lot is expected from them. Uh, is your generation, is your time. What would you think are the main constraints uh, for young people to realize their full potential in this uh, very globalized age and this uh, 
age of acceleration, you have artificial intelligence, AI, you have yeah. global value chains. I mean, you can do a lot of things online. Uh, the, 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 the digital economy is exploding every day. So, so there are a lot of opportunities. What are the constraints for Gambian young people to harness that? Is it economic? Is it political? Is it social? Is it just uh, the usual phrase, Gambian young people are lazy, they don't want to uh, venture into the unknown, they want the security of, of, of what they found here, and, and they don't want to really be uh, game changers or groundbreakers? Yeah, um, I think today a lot of young people are um, getting involved. Um, but like, like you mentioned it, I think we have challenges on all fronts. One of it being social is um, the challenges of coming from a very conservative society. A lot of young people in Gambia um, have been restricted by their, so, um, um, the, their social norms. One, when you are very adventurous, you know, it, it tends to hold you back, which is one. When you, when you look at our economical challenges, Data, for example, even though we are, we are in the era of technology, data is pretty expensive in Gambia compared to other countries. And now that we are in the technological era, you need data as an everyday tool to compete with people around the world. When you look at these, um, the political challenges, especially when it comes to policy, the issues of policy have been one of the biggest challenges. For example, as a startup in Gambia, how much do you pay as tax? How much? Um, how ready I am? Um, how is the government supporting you with, with when it comes to registrations and other things? So, bottle, there are a lot of bottlenecks here and there that have been able to curtail us. But all in all, I see young Gambians are really doing well today. Um, when you look at the fintech industry, you have a lot of Gambians who are in, in, into it now. When you look at um, other industries, when um, real estate, banking, and other things, a lot of young Gambians are doing well. But I think one of our biggest challenges that we have placed on ourselves is also not partnering. Um, that has been a big, uh, one of the biggest challenges as young Gambians that we need to look at. Why, why is that uh, so important, partnership? And uh, what really is the constraint? Because if we are doing the same thing, we want the same thing, what is holding us back from coming together and do that? I mean, in most countries now, you have this um, startup ecosystems. Yes. Uh, you have incubators, you have accelerators, which is a, an effort from the state to combine these uh, talents and uh, aggregate them uh, into something that can have an organic life. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what is what are the specific uh, challenges for, for, for your generation. Um, would be tough to pinpoint why we haven't been able to partner as young governments. But I think one of the biggest reasons is the idea of individualism that everybody wants to do it on their own and think that they, they can succeed whilst doing it on their own. But in, but, but in reality, success comes when partnerships are built. Uh, we're seeing what other young people around the world are doing. For example, we use the examples of Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs and others. And even not all, um, all the way in America, but even in Senegal. Um, young people in their different professions are building very strong um, um, Networks. networks today where every contract that the government puts out there they win it they, they you know when you look at the Damnyanjo projects that are going on now the contractors are young people the people who won the um, who won the contracts are young people and they build these teams why can't we have for example um, a, a Banjuri young professionals network for example mm -hmm. where young politicians young bankers young engineers can come together and have a very strong network and it just doesn't provide finance, but it also provides support. Where we, we, our net, because they say your network is your network. Imagine today if all of us, you know, um, were together and working together and trying to solve issues and problems. Mm -hmm. It's easier to contact and communicate when you guys are a network. But for some reason, we haven't been able to actualize this in the Gambia. And I think it's something that we shy away from. But it's a very big issue when I think yeah, about the yeah, collaboration of I would of your like people. to think that um, no. the government or the local government uh, can help in that. Because if the opportunities are presented mm -hmm. as uh, a team effort yeah. or is an aggregation, uh, if at all is a monthly. Because I remember when I was um, with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Caraba Hotel, yeah. uh, during the tourist season, uh, normally has a 
business um, uh, evening where a uh, professional would come and talk to some of the uh, guest investors. And uh, I mean, it's, it's a networking mm -hmm. opportunity and you, you know, everybody who comes in, you bring in your card yeah. and uh, you know, uh, the, the cards are distributed. Mm -hmm. I think uh, private sector as well as government has a role in enabling uh, some of these uh, uh, public good uh, uh, activities. Yeah. Because if you have a banjo business club, for example, or a kind of thing, uh, a coding center, uh, something like that uh, could inspire and encourage young people, especially during holidays yeah. or having competitions that would uh, uh, provide inspiration to young people. So. Uh, I think one of the factors uh, against uh, building such networks is uh, the absence of uh, the support of state institutions, yes. uh, local government agencies, because we see a lot of uh, philanthropic organizations. You mentioned Nene Han, yeah. uh, there is a Future in Our Hands. There are so many of them trying to increase the capability of uh, citizens and communities mm -hmm. so that they can solve their problem. Yeah. I, I think uh, uh, this takes us, of course, back to the kind of education we have. Uh, does, 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 does our education system help us solve problems in our communities? Uh, I, I once visited uh, a project in Jamnyajo, yeah. and that's what the technical advisor said, that people are giving a lot of diplomas and uh, you know they are not uh, having the requisite the skill. Yeah. yeah, the technical skill, and also the the uh, the innovation to to come together and and build things. So, uh, if you can just speak to that, because I know uh, KMC has been involved in some projects uh, that is aimed at empowering young people, yes. uh, especially in the uh, transport waste management uh, sector. Yeah, um, like you said, because what we are getting into now at KMC, especially with the youth offices, how do we provide more PPPs, especially when you have young, young entrepreneurs and, and also young innovative uh, um, partners. What we are doing is that considering that um, maybe a lot of young people have great ideas, mm -hmm. finance has been an issue. So what we believe is that young people coming together, especially under names of organizations or under names of you know um, partner partnerships or companies, to work with us. For example, our recycling beams, where we've used car tires, we gave a three million dollars a project to to young people f from Bakau K Point to come up with bins for us. When you look at our um, COVID-19 um, challenge that the mayor had, where we gave one million dollars to young people who would come up with um, um, ideas of solving problems where Outboost were winners and, you know, um, and, and also other companies. Where the, these are young people, but we believe that they can't do it alone. And we, we believe that the state also cannot do it alone. But there needs to be that collaboration between the state and also the entrepreneurs or the business community. So for uh, going further, I think this is the way young gamers need to see things, that the state cannot function on its own, while as the private sector also needs to see the state as, uh, as partners. In the long run, we are going to be the, um, the people in government. Young, young people that we are hanging out with today would be the people in the private sector. So from now, we need to see how best do we build that collaborative effort, and how would we be able to come together, because I believe when we talk about challenges of this country a lot, we tend to not focus on, on how we are not united. And in the, in, the, in the past couple of months, I haven't seen the Gambia as divided as we are now, especially because of politics. But we, how do we see that our diversity needs to bring unity, or that there is beauty in, the, in, in, for example, our diversity, and how do we work towards that? to make sure that it just doesn't bring us political gain, but also brings us um, um, economic gains. Um, the more network young people can build, the better their business opportunities are. And this is an idea I think we would look at at KMC of how do we have um, innovative weekends, for example, or how do we have networking events where young um, entrepreneurs within the municipality can come and, and build networks where even if it's called that, um, the, um, the Carnifing Business Weekend or Carnifing Business Week and other opportunities where we would be able to you know, um, foster our relationships. 
Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Kemo, uh, lastly, uh, you came out of your Congress, you are the Youth Secretary General of the United Democratic Party. What were your main resolutions? Yeah. Uh, we all know 2021 uh, is an election year. Uh, what is the state of preparedness of the youth wing of the party? Uh, everyone knows that they control the grassroots politics. Uh, what are the, some of the uh, resolve uh, positions you have taken so as to propel the UDP into uh, power? Yes, um, like you rightly mentioned, uh, we had our National Youth Congress not long ago, um, three weeks to be exact, in Farafini where we did give uh, a report on our activities as a youth wing from, uh, for the last two years. We also had elections on positions that were open and, and viable for other young people to also um, apply and get elected into. Because like you said, we, we did mention earlier that 65% of the population of this country are young people. So any political party that wants to get into government needs to get the support of the young people. And we do believe that with the youth wing we have in place and the plans and policies that we have to support uh, um, um, young people, we would be able to get their votes and also serve them when we are in government. One of the resolutions that we passed were that we have seen that when you talk about youth participation in politics, a lot of times, for example, um, other political parties where you have 60-year-olds as their youth um, coordinators who have also become their PROs or their spokespersons. And we want, when you say, a youth wing, it should be for young people. One of the resolutions that we passed during our Congress was that if you say young people, a, um, or the youth wing's leadership needs to be between the ages of 18 to 35. Another thing that we passed as a resolution is that we want when a UDP government comes into office that at least 30% of all government contracts be given to young people. What are some of the things that you reported on as uh, highlights uh, yes. in the last two years? Um, the biggest for us was our, our work towards sustainable development goal number two, which is to eradicate hunger. The youth wing of the United Democratic Party has started youth farms around the country, where we have seven youth farms where, which would be used as food banks, based on the leadership of the party leader, um, Honorable Hussein Odabo's National Food Bank call during the beginning of COVID-19. We want to see how best do we make these community-based initiatives where communities would farm, um, UDP members in these communities would farm, and then the proceeds would go back to their communities um, to, to help with malnutrition and, and also other things. And another thing was our blood donation drives, where we had young people or UDP militants donate blood to hospitals in Bansang, Base. Um, in Sarakunda Hospital and also Birikama because we have seen that a lot of women, especially during, during delivery, need blood. Um, another thing that we also uh, highlighted was that how we have been able to support by giving scholarships to young people. So these are all um, highlights that we as a youth wing um, did highlight in our report and we have also given our report to, to, to media houses um, it was published by some media houses and people had a read of it to know what the UDP Youth Wing has been up to. Kemo Bojang, thank you very much for coming on the political economy. We come your way every Monday, 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock, to talk about development, the political economy of it, how much we are doing, how well we can do, um, until I come your way next week. Have a good evening. Thank you. Afrifone is back in a brand new style. Afrisal, the biggest and the best GSM operator in the Gambia, is setting trends once again. Get an Afrifone for $350 only and receive one hour of free talk time spread over three months. $350 is only you can get a dual SIM phone with a wireless FM radio, memory card slot, internet access, long lasting battery, and one hour of free talk time. Where Afrisal goes, oh, oh, nobody dares to follow. Dares to follow. 
Jefferson is setting trends once again. I'm sure you still love WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and Viber. Your favorite GSM operator, Africell, knows this. That's why you can now enjoy more at the same price. Activate the social media bundle and be online for 24 hours for ten dollars is only. Hello. Activate the social media bundle for ten dollars is only and receive 40 megabytes. Where Africell goes, oh, oh, nobody dares to follow. Dares to follow. Has happened. Will happen. May happen. Is happening. Let us know. Send an email to info at btv.gm or call us 611-1666. Paradise TV, reflecting Gambia. The Gambia, the smiling coast of Africa. Let's get interactive on social media. Say your views and opinions with us on Facebook at PTV Gambia, Instagram at PTV Gambia, Twitter at PTV Gambia, and YouTube at PTV Gambia. You can download our app on Google Play Store and App Store. PTV Reflecting Gambia.